Okay, for the case today, I am doing the objective on schizophrenia and also on the urinary proteins and epithelials. This isn't going to be particularly high yield for our case, so a lot of the stuff I'm just going to blaze over. Uh, I am going to use a few uh, personal examples with the schizophrenia um, because my little brother uh, has been diagnosed with it, and so I have a little bit of experience with it, and I can kind of elucidate some of the symptoms and personal examples of what that might mean. So, um, talking to my little brother last time I saw him, he, he kept insisting that he had intelligence from military satellites that dated back to 2009. And so, I, I point that out because a lot of the symptoms of schizophrenia have to do with a disconnection from reality. Like, the thoughts that you have cannot be true. And there's subcategories of these type of thoughts. For example, thoughts of grandioseness. So, this may be classified as a thought of grandiose, uh, that he has a personal um, ability or mission in life that is, uh, that is higher and above the average person. Now, the term psychosis um, is kind of a, an umbrella term, uh, and there are a lot of causes. There is a list I found about ten different causes when I was looking into this kind of stuff. But in, in general, schizophrenia is a long-term mental disorder characterized by recurrent or persistent episodes of psychosis. And in that, it's a breakdown of relationships between the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And what that will lead to is your perception of reality is altered. It causes inappropriate feelings that can lead to inappropriate actions and a withdrawal from reality into delusion. Now, there's two subcategories of schizophrenia that were, uh, uh, one of them is not particularly recognized by the DSM-5, but there's a lot of research indicating that it is a real subcategory. In the past, there were subcategories such as paranoid schizophrenia and, and uh, other subcategories that have not been supported by evidence, and so they've been removed from the DSM-5. However, uh, some important uh, evidence-based categories are not added yet at this time. We'll talk about that as well. So we're going to take a look at exactly, uh, not exactly, but we're going to take a look at some possibilities about how schizophrenia happens, what's its pathogenesis. So there is some evidence that it's got genetic underpinnings and specifically the common subcategory of schizophrenia is strongly linked to genetics while the deficit oriented uh, schizophrenia, which is the subcategory, has more environmental uh, connections. But the genetic um, evidence shows support and it, it, we, there are specific ways that demonstrate a connection to the dopaminergic and glutamin, uh, glutamatergic pathways as well as uh, some connection to how it interacts with the major histocompatibility complex. Also on the long arm of chromosome 6, 6Q11, uh, there's some um, specific mutations that are highly associated with uh, schizophrenia. However, it's not seen in every case. So what that means is that schizophrenia is probably a heterogeneous disease. So I'm going to write that down, heterogeneous disease. And so basically it's a disease, it's a set of symptoms that is probably caused by several different diseases. We just haven't been smart enough yet to isolate and identify all of them. There's also some environmental uh, evidence that so, says, hey, this, is, this could be an environmental problem. So, for example, P, uh, whenever a mother has problems during birth and labor, such as maternal hemorrhaging, preterm labor, or blood incompatibilities. Also, anytime there's fetal hypoxia or an infection in the mother, th there's a strong association with those things in schizophrenia. For example, when my little brother was born, uh, he had um, aspirated his meconium and was uh, hospitalized for a couple of days for that. And uh, so I don't know if that's a contributing factor, but it's definitely associated with schizophrenia. Now, of the two different subtypes of uh, schizophrenia, one of them is strongly linked to being born during an influenza epidemic. So people that are born in late winter or early spring have a very strong association with 
a specific subtype of schizophrenia, and that would be the more environmentally linked type of schizophrenia. So, for example, my brother's birthday is December 20th, so that's in winter time. It's It was uh, December 20th, I think, in 1992, um, and so there was a flu going around about that time, so uh, it's during a flu epidemic. There are also some diseases that if you contract those diseases, you have a very, you have a, an increased uh, predictability of contracting schizophrenia, of, of a, uh, being diagnosed with schizophrenia. So, for example, a herpes simplex virus 2, um, if, you are, if you contract herpes simplex virus, then you have an increased chance of being diagnosed with schizophrenia. And then the measles virus antibodies, uh, then also if the mother has a high IgG for Toxoplasma gondii, so the toxoplasmosis that you can have uh, during pregnancy that uh, everyone's like, don't play with the kitty litter, that can be linked to schizophrenia as well. But it's interesting to note that not only does the child have an increased uh, risk of uh, schizophrenia, but the mother does as well of, of developing it later on in life. In our case, there was a urinalysis that showed uh, a positive uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, so use of marijuana, and also so under the toxicological and nutritional causes, cannabis use is the only toxicological cause, and it's associated with an odds ratio between 2.2 and 2.8 for um, the risk of, of having schizophrenia. And then vitamin D deficiency is also linked to um, increased chances of having the disease. Now, I used to tell my friends and family that I'm insane in the membrane, but if you want to stay sane, there is actually a study that shows having rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the populations with rheumatoid arthritis have lower rates of schizophrenia than the general population. So if you want to stay normal, just get some crazy arthritis. So the pathophysiology, nobody really knows what's going on, and that's probably true with most neurological diseases, that the brain has so many millions of connections, it's almost impossible to know exactly how everything is firing, especially in the disease state. But uh, the dopamine, so a lot of the neurotransmitters are implicated in the disease. For example, dopamine, glutamate, GABA and acetylcholine, all these are neurotransmitters, and so the dopamine, it, all drugs with antipsychotic properties block dopamine receptors. So, uh, for example, uh, clozapine, which is it's a very weak D2 antagonist, it's the best drug for treating schizophrenia. Now, why is that important is because it's only a weak D2 antagonist, and it, it may be doing other things as well, or it may just be... Sp uh, identifying a specific subtype of D2 uh, receptors and blocking those, and so exactly how the drug is is acting the best or better than other D2 antagonists is not exactly known. Now, the glutamate uh, will bind to a receptor called N-methyldiaspartate or NMDA. So these NMDA glutamate receptors, they're uh, they're malfunctioning or functioning at a lower rate in general, in those observed with schizophrenia, and that's diagnosed usually post-mortem. But, so drugs have been developed to enhance glutamate neurotransmission, and the results have kind of been varied. And it, it'll depend on the person, and also depend on the drug. So some glutamate receptor and uh, agonists, or glutamate agonists, will work on one person and not the other, and uh, different drugs work on different people but there, there's nothing consistent. Now, GABA is one of the uh, main inhibitors in the brain, and there's a, a GABA decarboxylase enzyme, and that mRNA, whenever you examine bodies post-mortem, uh, studies have shown a decreased level of GABA decarboxylase uh, mRNA. So, the mRNA being what makes the protein, so there's presumably less protein. So if you don't have the GABA decarboxylase, you probably have way too much GABA activity, and uh, so you're inhibiting a whole bunch of pathways that need to be firing.
So then you have acetylcholine, which it acetylcholine acts on receptors that are also sensitive to nicotine, and there's an increase in smoking activity in individuals with schizophrenia. So some people think that acetylcholine receptors may have some problems, and that's why people will uh, smoke more often when they have schizophrenia. But the kind of the evidence behind this is that whenever you treat with nicotinic drugs, it can normalize some things, especially eye tracking. So um, some problems with the eyes and, and how they track is decreased in schizophrenia, and nicotine can actually improve those symptoms. Exactly how that works is still in investigation, however, so it may just be that um, having an overstimulation of those receptors is compensating for the problem that's happening somewhere else. So it may not be an acetylcholine problem at all. It's just going to require more studies to figure out. Now when you get to the clinical aspect of it, there's going to be some positive symptoms and some negative symptoms. I want to focus really quick on the negative symptoms, which include flat affect, poverty of speech, inattentiveness, and then me memory and executive function impairments. Now, I have a list in my study guide of all the subcategories of these four things and, and sort of examples of what they are, so you can go in there and look at that. But the negative symptoms, if you just have negative symptoms and nothing else, that would be called the deficit subtype. The deficit subtype of schizophrenia. And then if you have the positive and the negative, or a couple of the positive and one or two of the negative as well, that would be your normal, sub, your normal schizophrenia. Or you might call it typical. Typical schizophrenia. Like I was saying earlier, this deficit subtype, it's not in the DSM-5, so the, the manual that we that is the standard for how you diagnose different mental disorders and what a mental disorder is, it's not listed as a specific mental disorder in this standard book. Um, but it's characterized, like, like I said, by negative symptoms, and I pointed those out. Uh, but in, this subtype has a stronger association with genetics. So like if your mother, father, aunt, uncle, or cousin, brother, or sister have this specific type of schizophrenia, that means that there's uh, you have a higher risk of having it yourself or of getting it later on in life. And this is associated with a disproportionate number of summer births. Now remember I said the non-deficit non type has a higher correlation with winter births and is associated with flu epidemics. So the winter type, or this non-deficit type, this typical, we'll put typical type, is associated with more with environmental factors. So the way I'm going to remember this, of course, my little brother, he, he has both positive and negative symptoms. He has this grandiose uh, vision of who he is, and he also has this, um, this disconnected uh world that I have no idea what it is or what you know what's going on in this world that he's in but he also has these negative things like uh he's addicted he has he smokes he um has a lower activity and flat speech affect so um he has this what you would consider a typical type correlated with um with uh environmental factors what I'm trying to say, guys, really, is that I'm probably not crazy. Okay? Because it's, it doesn't run in the genes. So here's what are the first rank symptoms of schizophrenia, and I'm just going to read them all to you, but uh, a couple of them I want to point out. My little brother, whenever I first realized there was definitely something wrong with him, he came up to me and he was like, I know you know what I'm thinking. He's like, some of us... Some of us can tell what other people are thinking. You're one of the, you can hear what I'm thinking, right? And I was like, no, but I, I'd be really glad for you to tell me. He's like, don't pull my chain. So these are first ring symptoms, and they're, they're important in uh, the diagnostic algorithm of how do you know if somebody has it. So you have to have two first rank symptoms and two second rank symptoms and a, or a deficit symptom and so there's you look in the DSM-5 it's a complicated like you have to go through and check check off each thing and that's how you diagnose you can just go through your symptoms of first rank second rank deficit you check off the things and if it meets all the standards and criteria and you can't rule out you ruled out everything else then it's schizophrenia 
So what do you want to rule out? The first thing you want to rule out is Wilson's disease. So you would look for the Kaiser Flesher rings in the eyes. And so it, this would be a problem with copper metabolism. You could check seroloplasm as well. Uh, the differential diagnosis for psychiatric disorders um, would, so this would be like a metabolic disorder, Wilson's, I, I'm pretty sure. But the psychiatric disorders you want to rule out would be uh, schizophreniform disorder, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar, major depression with psychotic features, and substance abuse psychotic disorders. And with my little brother, I think actually this is the only one that wasn't ruled out, and, and some, there's some more background information on why I think that's important, but that's personal. Okay, we're going to change gears a little bit because uh, in our case we had some protein and epithelial cells in the urine, and um, so that's my objective uh, I'm working on as well as the schizophrenia. So what is the protein in the urine? Uh, it's typically an indicator of glomerular or tubular renal dysfunction, or function rather. So are the glomerulus uh, filtering out the protein? Yes or no? And then if they are, is there another way for protein to get into the urine? Now, I, that was my personal question. I couldn't find anything that answered that definitively, but I thought perhaps that cell lysis could leak protein into the urine, and I, I didn't find that anywhere. So, um, But here are the lists from the various differential diagnosis books. They all list basically the same thing. So nephrotic syndrome. Uh, Preeclampsia is pretty big for pregnant women. If you have protein in the urine, that's the very key indicator that uh, pre of preeclampsia. And so they got to start getting evaluated, checking their blood pressure and that kind of stuff. And of course, diabetes mellitus. We've all uh, become very familiar with the fact that high blood sugar can cause damage to the kidney. Uh, glomerulonephritis. Amyloidosis, which is the de deposition of amyloid plaques at various places. There's different types of amyloids, and uh, so um, that's something else that can cause this damage. And then another one would be multiple myeloma is um, on the differential with protein in the urine. Okay, now... Um, protein in the urine, what you want to do if you have that is you want to get a 24-hour urine specimen to quantify the amount of protein. That will kind of, that'll give you an indication of the severity of what's going on. But, uh, and that's usually what you would do, A, when, whenever you know the diagnosis, and B, um, that, so when you know the diagnosis, you do that. But um, you can also do that without knowing the diagnosis, I guess, just to check on renal function in general and to treat that, that uh, accordingly. But there are some interfering factors, so it's some things that can cause increased uh, protein in the urine. And one thing that I, I found was really interesting is that if you take a cold bath, it will increase the protein in your urine. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but I, I'm guessing it has... I'm just, I have no really good guesses, so your guess is as good as mine. Um, radiopaque, uh, radiopaque contrast, if you've got a contrast imaging within the last three days, you're going to get a false positive on the protein, uh, proteinuria. Um, and then, of course, there's contamination from the prostate or the uh, vagina, so um, different things can cause secretions there, and I don't want to go into that because they're gross. Um, the high protein diet, if you're working out and you're taking 82 grams of protein every three hours so you get huge muscles like mine, then you'll have also protein in your urine. Now if you're measuring protein using the dip dipstick method, there's something called Bence Jones proteins that can show up there. And what that's suggestive of is multiple myeloma and Waldenstrom's macroglobin anemia. Uh, and I, I highlighted uh, Waldenstrom's, beca Waldenstrom's because... I looked into the symptoms, and several of them fit with uh, symptoms we have in our case. I don't think it's really high on the differential because uh, a lot of the symptoms would occur, uh, a lot of the symptoms where we're seeing uh, parallels in our case would occur very late in the disease process, and there w we would see a lot of other, th there's a lot of other things that we should see with Waldenstrom's that we don't, but it was out of all of the um, various things for protein in the urine, this was the only one that really uh, jumped out with its list of uh, symptoms and such. 
Other things that can cause protein in the urine, it got cut off here as some drugs. And there's a list of medications, and I didn't want to put them all on here, but a list of medications in the study guide that you can go look through, and it can cause uh, proteinuria. What about the epithelial cells? Well, the, you have desquamation, so the cells will typically, as they, um, as the the basal layer of the epithelium is growing from the bottom, it's pushing all the older cells up, and they desquamate, and that would be typically the cells of the bladder and urethra. When kidney cells desquamate, typically they'll form casts, and so you see those those epithelials less often uh, in a urinalysis, but it's not completely impossible. So then what are the abnormals? Usually you get reported as few, moderate, and or many, and I couldn't find a table to say how that's calculated if a few is 1 to 15 or, or whatever the case may be. So I didn't, I wasn't able to find that, but it's usually reported as few, moderate, or many. In our case it was moderate at low power focus. And it will typically be indicative of an inflammation, infection, or malignancy, or the other possibilities that it's contaminated from surrounding tissues. So um, if cells from the tip of the penis, for example, got into the urine sample, then that would, that would cause a contamination. Another thing we didn't see on our report was the type of epithelial cells. And everywhere I looked said you should know the type of epithelial cell because it will help you to localize the problem. For example, we know that in much of the urinary tract, it's, uh, it's lined with something called transitional epithelium. So transitional. And if we knew that we had transitional cells, we would at least know that a larger portion or specific uh, portions of the urinary tract could be uh, affected. If it was something like cuboidal or, yeah, for example, cuboidal cells, then we would be looking within the kidney or that type of thing. Now, we're, we've all studied uh, histology, so go back and look at your histo notes and um, then kick whoever wrote this case up for not being more specific.